teach uh, green building, and um, and I also uh, teach environmental pollution topics. So that's my area of expertise, and I'm very happy to, to be involved in this. I'm very happy to have you all here. So uh, our judge today is uh, is, is uh, G. Modell Clark, okay. Modell Clark, uh, Reverend. Dr. G. Modell Clark, and uh, he's been the new, the uh, the senior pastor at the New Progressive Baptist Church in Kingston, New York, for 20 years. He's also the director of the Mid Hudson Institute for Christian Studies, an online affiliate of Trinity Theological Seminary. Uh, he's a former professional lecturer of communication, School of Communication and the Arts, Marist College, uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, for 16 years. Clark received a Master's of Divinity and a Doctor of Ministry from Trinity Theological Seminary. He was also inducted into the National Omicron PSI Honor Society for his distinguished theological scholarship and community service. Uh, Clark also studied at the New York Theological Seminary, where he was a recipient of the Benjamin Mays Fellowship. He's graduated from the, from, uh, the State University of New York SUNY at New Paltz with a BS degree in English, with a journalism concentration and elementary education. Uh, he then graduated from Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and was a journalist for several years, serving as a reporter, an editor, a columnist, and a freelance magazine writer. So we're very honored to have you here today as a judge, and uh, very pleased to have everybody here today. Um, so we have, uh, we have three papers, and um, the, first, uh, the first presenter is, uh, is, is Kina Bram, um, and she's going to present the Haitian Revolution, the roots of Haiti's poverty, but not the core of Haiti's despair. And uh, her mentor is Sholomo Libby. Hi. Hello. And uh, hello, camera. Um, and uh, and uh, she's from the uh, the Northampton Community College. And then we have uh, we have Rima. And you'll have to say your second name for me, your last name. Oh, no, 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 Rima. Okay. Uh, Sakawala. Uh, and, and that's going to be this uh, Rethinking Eight, the Significance of Tattoos in a Global Context. Um, and and uh, her mentor is Shweta Sen. She's not here, unfortunately. And then uh, Montgomery Community College. Welcome. Uh, and then Ivanka Rizkala. Yeah. Okay, the Palestinian Christian Alive Among the Shadows. Mentor Nathan Zook. And... Uh, Welcome, also from Mon Montgomery Community College. So we have a we have a full uh, a full list of uh, of um, events. So we're gonna we're gonna crack right on with it. Just to let you know how we're gonna go about it. We're going to first of all we're gonna hear from each of the presenters. They're going to present their papers, uh, and then when they're when they're finished, uh, then we'll uh, the judge will be asking his questions, and um, and when the question when the uh, the judge has, has finished with his questions, uh, Mr. Madal then uh, we'll be able to open it up to everybody else. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to invite the um, uh, camera up, first of all. And, um, judges, advisors, mentors, and fellow presenters. A special thanks to my mentor, Shalma Levy, who was the catalyst for my research. I am privileged to present my research on Haiti here at the 23rd Annual 2015 Beacon Conference. In his book, The Problem of Slavery in the Age of Emancipation, historian David Brian Davis argues that Haiti is the point at which Western nations begin to question the morality of slavery. He points out to the fact that until the Haitian Revolution in the early 1800s, there were no abolitionist movements anywhere in the world. He captures the spirit of this idea by referencing an astounding passage from Douglas, Frederick Douglass's 1893 speech, Lecture on Haiti. In this passage, Douglass says, 
Until Haiti spoke, no Christian nation had abolished Negro slavery. Until she spoke, the slave trade was sanctioned by all Christian nations of the world, and our land of liberty and light included. Until Haiti spoke, the church was silent and the pulpit dumb. In this essay, we argue that the Haitian Revolution is the root of Haiti's poverty, but not the source of Haiti's current despair. Though the historical significance of this event is appreciated by some scholars, the ways in which the United States and Western nations have continued to undermine Haiti's development is not widely known. We will see how a combination of historical and contemporary events combine to create the present reality where Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. During its slavery period, from 1625 to 1789, Haiti's main source of income was generated from its production and barter of sugar, coffee, cotton, and agricultural goods. However, as punishment for becoming independent in 1804, the new Haiti was afflicted by global economic sanctions and embargoes imposed by Europe and the United States. Haiti was further afflicted when France orchestrated and enforced sanctions of obligatory debt peonage. These fees were reimposed over a period of years that did not end until 1947. Haiti's economic development was further impeded through the persistent attempts made by the United States to create a democracy out of the country's already fragile, economic, unstable government, and through the United States' invasive military presence and occupation. Who, if anyone, is responsible for Haiti's steadily declining economy? What constitute Haiti's crumbling democracy? The aforementioned factors illustrates how Haiti fell into a cycle of despair. Haiti is officially known as the Republic of Haiti. It's a nation located in the Western Hemisphere. As a map here indicates, Haiti's geographical location is on the western third of the island of Hispanola, and the rest of the island is occupied by the Dominican Republic. Hispanola sits between the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean. The capital of Haiti is Port-au-Prince. The Haitian Revolution was initiated in 1791 and ended in 1804. The initial conflict transpired between mulattoes with lighter complexions and the Haitians with darker skin. The feud was between the mulattoes who were attempting to enslave and exploit the darker majority population. This class conflict ultimately led up to the Haitian Revolution and in many ways continues to this day and the struggle of power and economic resources. Eventually, all Haitians joined forces and revolted in the French colony of Saint Dominique. They fought a battle that lasted for 12 years, which resulted in the elimination of slavery and the founding of the Republic of Haiti on January 1st, 1804. The country was emancipated and gained its independence by defeating the French forces sent by Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Vertiers. I find noteworthy, though we may all be aware of the American and French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution is of significant importance, especially here in America. Had it not been for Napoleon losing Haiti, which during the colonial era was one of the wealthiest centers of the world, producing more wealth for France than Cuba and Jamaica combined, Napoleon would not have been compelled to sell America the land that was gained during the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million. The purchase contributed to the huge expansion of the American territory, as this map here indicates. The pink area on the map shows the United States prior to the Louisiana Purchase. However, you can see how America expanded tremendously by that pur purchase. Haiti was the first black country to successfully gain its independence. It is the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere because the United States, which began its revolution in 1776, was re recognized as being an independent nation with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The United States did not recognize Haiti as an independent nation because African Americans were still held as chattel property in the United States. Toussaint Louverture is a prominent figure in the Haitian Revolution. He lived from 1743 until 1803. Toussaint was one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution 
and one of the first blacks to become a governor of our colony. He began as a slave in the French colony of San Domingue, which was owned by the Count de Brera. Toussaint's owner contributed to his education and encouraged him to learn how to read and write. The Toussaint was freed from slavery at the age of 33, and records indicate that he himself became a slave owner. This is reflective of the class conflicts that emerged before the revolution. The price of freedom came with many consequences for the newly emancipated Haitians. After the death of Toussaint Louverture, there arose a shift in power. The re revolution's general in chief was now Jean Jacques Dessalines. His approach to the revolution unleashed extreme aggression towards white slave owners. On January 1st, Dessalines declared Haiti as a new nation and proclaimed, we must live independently or die. Brian David Bryant argues that the atrocities orchestrated by Dessalines in the aftermath of the revolution had catastrophic consequences. For Haiti and all future liberation struggles by the black people, including those in the United States. David states the Salonians ordered the extermination of whites remaining in Haiti, and the abolitionists were long obsessed with disavowing violence or any form of slavery resistance. This explains why the United States, which initially supported Haitians, came to fear black independence. The Haitian example, if it were to spread to the United States, conjured fears that the abolition of slavery would lead to a similar massacre of the whites. It created a nightmare scenario that resonated all over the world. Abolitionist literature had tended to portray slaves as passive victims or as sentimental objects of benevolence. However, the acts of the revolution under the paradigm of Dessalines made it difficult for abolitionists to view slavery in the same light. Hence, the success of the Haitian Revolution became an isolated event. The implementation of embargoes and fees ensued as punitive measures. This meant that Haiti could not evolve economically or politically. An incumbent factor that stifled Haiti's economy were the sequential fees imposed by the French. These fees crippled the nation's economy. Immediately after becoming an independent nation, a fee of 60 billion francs, equivalent to $7 billion in US currency, was imposed and stipulated to be paid in increments over a period of 30 years. This was the initial accrued peonage that was imposed on Haiti by the French. The monies from this debt would be used as compensation for the land and the value of slaves owned by the French. This would be equivalent to the United States being required to pay Great Britain for the land it won during the American Revolution. The extortion inflicted for compensation went unchallenged and Haiti did not meet the deadline of the initial payment agreement. The result of this was that additional fees and interest were assessed in the amount of 150 million francs. In 1938, President Boyer, a Haitian bureaucrat, accepted the attached interest and fees that were assessed to the already existing debt. He also signed an emancipation document, which served as written proof of independence from the French. Haiti was anxious to have this document because there was a constant fear of recolonization that threatened the independent country by the French. Subsequently, Haiti was compelled to borrow from the French bank in order to assist with the final payment. This debt plagued the economy of Haiti for over 80 years, and it was not completely paid until 1947. The United States government contributed to Haiti's financial ruin when it issued sanctions and boycotts against Haiti's sugar exports. These embargoes banned the very same items that flourished in Haiti's economy. The sanctions also taxed the ships that transported those items. The economic constraints through American sanctions that were imposed on Haiti did not end until 1863, the same year as the Emancipation Proclamation. These actions depleted Haiti's resources by staggering amounts. This led, this made it easy and nearly impossible for Haiti to have the resources to help its people. It left the Haitians at the mercy of the United States, who offered relief as they supported corrupt leaders of Haiti's fragile democracy. As a corollary result of the revolution, the United States attempted to create a democracy, which instead creatively 
created a plutocracy, where the wealthiest 3% governed the poorest 97%. This is the result of five prior attempts at establishing Haiti's government after the revolution that failed dramatically. Though this error may not have been viewed by most as an attempt at democracy by the United States, I embrace the perspective of Paul Farmer, a Harvard professor of global health. He points out how the United States conducted a military occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934. Washington administrators forged and imposed institutions on Haiti's weak leaders. The emergence of another type of authoritarian regime was promoted and infiltrated Haiti. This occurred with the indirect backing of the United States government. Through the military presence, the United States Congress exerted a tremendous influence over the events in Haiti. For example, the United States protected the ruthless Papa Doc Duvalier and his son Baby Doc as brutal dictators of the country. Baby Doc obtained a president for life political power under the revised constitution in 1983. The father and son duo murdered over 100,000 Haitians with machetes and practiced rule as a way of life. The Reagan administration realized that the Haitians grew reluctant and weary of the terror orchestrated. It was determined that Baby Doc would be at risk of being assassinated because of his actions. The Reagan administration airlifted him to a retirement villa in France and started talking about reviving, reviving another democratic process. Aristide was a great part of this process. He was the winning candidate of Haiti's first democratic elections held on December 16, 1990, which were held in Haiti's capital port of Prince. Anastide was the first president elected to the office of Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier, and he was a pro-democratic leader. The United States deployed troops to ensure a peaceful transition out of fear of the residue of the previous government. This was the anniversary of Haiti's 1986 liberation from three decades of rule by the Duvalier dynasty. Washington viewed his election more in terms of ideology than in the light of the fact that this would actually be the replication of a stable democracy. The people whom the United States assisted to gain power for the sake of democracy continue to deplete Haiti's finances. Mismanagement of government monies that were allocated for the initial economic improvement of Haitian people were misappropriated by those in power. The top 3% of the population had stored the wealth through the authoritarian regime and entitled themselves to government aid, including monetary assistance, education, and a better quality of life. As corrective measure, after the pro-democratic leader, Aristide, was put in office a second time, the lenders of the International Monetary Fund demanded Aristide now make vigorous changes. They did actions such as privatizing, ending fuel subsidies, boosting tax collection, and reducing government payroll. The attempt at correcting mismanagement and corruption put a freeze on monetary support from the Washington from 1994 to 1997. The reluctance to continue to distribute aid due to what appeared to be blatant pilfering further distressed the already fragile economy. My experience, as a Haiti, my experience in Haiti as a soldier substantiates this argument. I had the opportunity to tour Haiti in the mid-1990s. At that time, I occupied a uh, role as Army personnel. I was a junior NCO. And our unit was given orders to deploy to Haiti. Though many people in the United States had a higher aspiration for our involvement, the end result was that Haiti remained in turmoil then, and Haiti is still suffering 20 years later. We were informed that there was a coup during the presidential elections for Jean Bertrand out of Steve. Port-au-Prince was a bloody, heart ripping massacre. People fought relentlessly during the deployment, and I was devastated by the poverty level that gripped and embarrassed a country that was among the first to gain its independence. I was also conflicted inwardly and it resonated in me that I, too, am of Bastilian descent. I understood the ancestry of the people. I sympathized with the people and their culture. These feelings, coupled with witnessing firsthand the oppression of those same people, were for feelings of compassion for the Haitian people. I was engulfed by feelings of opprobrium for the suffering that surrounded my brothers and sisters, the Haitian people. I saw women and children begging to wash clothing for 25 cents. The pungent stench of feces penetrated the atmosphere as it burned from every direction due to lack of proper running latrines. You can find egg on the ground at 5 o'clock in the morning because the sun being raised of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 
what I found to be a frequent occurrence were people practicing and demonstrating voodoo by blowing some sort of dust into the already stifling climate. I believe that this was performed by the people in hopes that a mystical power would begin resolving the issues that have pulverized their country. There was a small population of citizens who lived in surrounding areas that were extremely wealthy. How could this be? The disdain that I felt when I was there continues to plague me. The deployment was strategized as a peacekeeping tactic. However, research has brought to light those unanswered questions that haunted me from this tour. What could be done to restore a country that has spiraled into economic dysfunction? America should concentrate on helping Haiti with education and health care instead of directly focusing on their government. According to Etheridge and Handelman, non-governmental NGOs can influence Haiti in the area of education and health care and the environment, thus promoting the needs of the country's poor, but have no formal link to the Haitian government. I believe that this approach can be effective in helping strengthen the legitimacy and the democracy and its development by providing the means for Haiti to do its own self-help efforts. Thank you. Well, like a couple of seconds to go. Yeah, thank you. All right, now we have our.